Good morning. I'd like to read a Bible text here before I sing for you this morning about Paul. It's found in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verses 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that loves his appearing. The song I'm going to sing for you this morning is in regards to Paul, and it's called Sustaining Faith. Being in prison for the cause of Christ. Three times being beaten, tortured, oh, what a price. But Paul remained faithful. Till he finished the race Ever before him Was God's sustaining grace Sustaining grace Till the end of it all Sustaining grace till the last sunset falls. Always there, everlasting, enough to see you through. Sustaining grace. Is there for me and you? There'll be joy in each trial that no man can take away. Peace that passeth understanding in. Each passing day, love beyond all measure as we look into his face. There is nothing like it, God's sustaining Sustaining grace till the end of it all. Sustaining grace till the last sunset falls. Always there. Everlasting enough to see you through sustaining grace is there for me and you. Amen. Sustaining grace is there for me. Years ago, I was, I was coming home at night, and uh, I had the radio on, and these two preachers were on there, and they were discussing the Bible, and they said, you know, there's some stories in there you just can't believe. There's some of them that I just, there's, he said, the story of Jonah and the whale, that's ridiculous. 
And then the other one said, yeah, and what about the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? He said, that's, he said, that can't be. He said, the only thing I can come up with is they probably had a little cave and the disciples had food in there and they brought them out. You know, <clears throat> if God can create this world in six days, he can, he can do whatever he wants to do, can he? I had another guy tell me one time, he said, uh, you know, the Bible, you can't trust it. It's crazy old men wrote that book. He said, there's nothing in there that you can really trust. But I don't know of another book that can take, it, take somebody and change you completely. If you start reading it, it will change your life. And I don't believe it's written by a bunch of crazy old men. I believe it's God-inspired men to do this. So I invite you this morning to take your Bibles with me today and turn to Revelation. And we're going to read uh, Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading of this word. I like a good debate. Did anybody crazy write the Bible? Can you think of one chapter where a crazy man wrote the Bible? How about Daniel chapter 4? Nebuchadnezzar is the author of Daniel chapter 4, and he was seven years crazy. <laughs> Anyhow, I want to talk to you today about what you are, hopefully. How many here are Seventh-day Adventists? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? What makes you a Seventh-day Adventist? You know, if you get online, I got online yesterday, not to change my sermon, but I typed in the word Adventism. Do you know what Adventism is? You know what communism is? It's a belief. Communists believe in communism. So what's Adventism? It's the beliefs of the Adventist. And I typed in, not Adventist or something like that, for some reason I typed in Adventism. And with all the hits that came up, there was one that said, Catholic Encyclopedia. And having come from there, I thought that would be an interesting one to read. And it is. And they have us nailed to the point. Everything in there that they say negative of us is true. It's, it's unique. It's, it's the Advent message. They have the whole Advent message. If, if you or I were to read that, we'd say, that's us. But praise the Lord, maybe someone else would read that that might be Catholic or Baptist or something and wonder, well, what do the Catholics think of Adventists? And if they would read that, it might be enough to turn them. It tells them what we believe. It quotes Ellen White's quotes about popery and everything else. And it's unique, brothers and sisters. It has us down for what we are. Unique. And it, it fit my sermon today. If someone was to ask you what church you go to or what you are, praise the Lord if you'll say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. They might not agree with that, the Christian part, because of what they believe Adventists believe. But you are. You are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. It doesn't mean we don't have problems in our church. We do. If you were Satan, which church would you hate today? 
The one out not giving a message or the one giving the message? And you and I are giving the Advent message. It can be called the midnight cry. It can be called whatever you want to call it. But you and I have a special message today. There will always be problems. We'll always have problems. But brothers and sisters, he didn't say it today, and I'm thankful I get to say it, Ron. I'm glad I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Ron always says that when he comes up to the mic. And I'm thankful for this church. It's a lighthouse in this town and the surrounding little towns. We have a sense, brothers and sisters, we are a church with something, you know, hospitals have this and other people have this and maybe other churches have this. They have a mission. It's a mission statement. You ever read some of them? And they're good. But brothers and sisters, we as a church have a mission. We not only have missions overseas, we have a mission. And that is to bring people to the truth in these last days. And that's Adventism. It is sad to know that many denominations have lost their sense of mission. If you read about the Reformers, if you read about the founders of the other churches, they had a mission. And they knew what they were doing. And they may not have all the truth, as you and I say today. But they had the truth God gave them, and they got onto a mission, and they were out doing it. And their churches are not doing that mission work anymore. They're headed back from where they came. And the churches are declining. And the older generation is dying off. And some may be well, one generation from, from extinction, some of these churches. How many here have driven by a Seventh-day Baptist church? I went through a town, knocking on doors, and I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. They said, did you have the, the church over on Seventh-day Hill? And I says, I don't remember the Adventist ever having, oh, she said, that was the Seventh-day Baptist. They used to be. I met one lady that was a Seventh-day Baptist. I only met her because she married a Seventh-day Adventist. And they thought with the Sabbath in common they could have a good marriage, which they didn't. But you and I are blessed because we have the message for the last days. So tell me, what makes you different as an Adventist from all the other denominations? This, Advent, this, this website for the Catholics started out by saying they believe some things we believe. You believe in the Trinity? They believe in the Trinity. You believe in God? They believe in God. They went down the list. And then a new list started. But here, crazy as they are, is what they believe beyond this. Adventists have a different message to preach today than any other denomination. We preach a distinct message in this church, a unique message that you won't get anywhere else. You can sit in any church and you will not hear the message we preach. In our church, when people join our church, they seldom feel that they've just joined another church. At least I hope you feel like you've joined something other than a church. The Bible says God added to his church daily that such as should be saved. But when the pastor baptized Mary Ann and I, he told us, just us, maybe he said it from the pulpit, I don't remember, you two have joined a movement, the Advent movement. Have you ever heard those words? The great Advent movement. Not just another church, not a church with roots that wants to stay here on this earth, a church that's looking to go to heaven. Maranatha, they believe that they're leaving here. It's a movement. It's headed somewhere. Who else preaches Daniel and Revelation like Seventh-day Adventists? They skip over things. They, 
They ignore things. They, they say this hasn't happened yet when it has. You and I have a unique message today. Praise the Lord for Adventism. Adventists preach a timeless but a relevant message. I grew up in a church. They've changed their beliefs. There's things within that church that's changed. But our message has never changed. There's people in our church who would like to change our message. Don't go with those. We're told that the Bible says we are to give a trumpet call. And it says in the Bible that it has a certain sound, that trumpet call. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming soon. And the church should be giving a trumpet sound. 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will be ready for battle? I looked through the other Bibles. In the New Jerusalem Bible, I'm going to quote it because it, listen to what it says about this. It says, It is the trumpet sounds, if the trumpet sounds a call that is unrecognizable, who's going to get ready for the attack? The trumpet has to give a certain sound. If you've watched any of the old movies and all that, the, the, the general yells over to the trumpeter, sound, and he sounds, and they either retreat or they go forward, or they get up out of their beds. John the Baptist gave a certain trumpet sound, and who didn't like it? The church. Jesus gave a certain trumpet sound, and who didn't like it? The church. And the biggest church of that day was, was their own church. But what's the biggest church today, brothers and sisters? The Catholic church. And it doesn't like our trumpet sound. Bless their heart, if you had any inclination of Adventism and you got on their encyclopedia, you might become one. That article gives a beautiful trumpet sound of what we believe. The disciples trumpeted a clear sound. Who didn't like it? Paul gave a trumpet sound. Who didn't like it? And thank you for the song today. It says he was beaten. He was ready to go to prison because he wasn't afraid of the trumpet sound he was going to give. Adventists have a dynamic and a unique message today, brothers and sisters. We are truly Christians, believing in salvation by grace, totally through the merits of Jesus Christ. Today, some so-called Christians have become so sophisticated in their sinning, Instead of committed Christians, they're committed sinners. No one's going to be perfect. We'll sin till Jesus comes. But he will take us home. Because we've been saved. I believe that when sin is not declared from the pulpit, the people will lose their, their sense of right and wrong. It's up to ministers to step on toes. We should do that. We should point out sin while pointing to a Savior who can save you from that sin. I had a Baptist man who was raised Adventist. And I met him at, at things outside the church with his mother, who was praying for him. And one day, it was her special day, and he gave in, she invited him to church, and I preached a message. And when he left that sanctuary, he said, you stepped all over my toes, and I'm mad. Why are you mad, brother? Because I belong to the Baptist church since I left this one. And that pastor's never stepped on my toes. And tomorrow, being Sunday, I'm going to go to church and let them know I had to go to the Adventist church to have my toes stepped on. 
and ask him, when are you going to start stepping on toes? Isn't that unique? Praise the Lord, I hope he did it. He's the type to do it. Do you and I want to live in a gray area? You know what the gray area is? It's not our heads here today. What does Jesus call the gray area? I wish you were hot or cold, but I don't want you lukewarm. Are you an Adventist today? Jesus is saying, if you read that text, I would rather have you cold. Tell me, just go fly a kite. Because then maybe I can reach you, but you're lukewarm. I don't have any idea how to reach you. You and I have a message to give today, and that message is Isaiah 8.20. To the law and to the testimony... If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Don't ever quote that text wrong. Do never, never ever say to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no truth in them. It says light, and leave that word there. Others are preaching partial truth. Other people are quoting parts of scripture. And brothers and sisters, it is more dangerous than somebody getting up and talking and never quoting scripture. I think this, I think that. You, you say, well, I don't care what you think. But when they misquote scripture or partially quote scripture, it's dangerous. I had a children's story once. I says, here's a bottle of 7-Up. Who would like it? Oh, the kids all raise their hands. I said, before I came, I opened it up, I dumped a little poison in and then popped the cap back on. Nobody wanted the 7-Up. You see a little poison in a 7-Up, is the 7-Up still there? A little truth, a lot of truth with a little air is air. This says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. You and I should be able to give the trumpet call, a certain sound. Who else can preach the three angels' message? Adventists should be a loving people. I'll never forget, and, and they were right. This one young man says, I'll tell you what, I married an Adventist. And when I go to church with her, I hear the truth. But you folks are unfriendly. You come over to my church, and they'll love you to death. But they don't have the truth. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Husband and wife married. They want to come back to the church. They were into drugs. They were into everything. And I visited them, and somehow the pastor showed up right after that. And those two visits, something straightened out in their mind. What are we doing? We should get back to church. Well, if you come to my church, well, you come to my church. So they went to both. They had to go to church on Sabbath and Sunday. And they got out the old Bible stories and started reading them to their kids. And he got so spiritual going to our church that they made him Sunday school teacher at his church. And he got so wound up on what he learned at our church that he started Sunday school teaching it at his church and he found out that all their friendliness was fake. They denounced him as a teacher. They told him he wasn't allowed at the men's fellowship breakfast. He couldn't do anything in that church because he was teaching Adventism. He was actually teaching what he learned out of the scriptures. But it doesn't fit Baptist. So maybe it's better to have the truth than to be friendly. But why can't we have the truth and be friendly? Why can't we be friendlier to the church down there that doesn't have the truth? Well, some people are extremely friendly because they don't have to do anything. They don't have to pay tithe. They don't have to support anything. And the church still loves them, so they love the church. 
But God's given us a special message. And that message is that you and I need to love one another unconditionally. And if we struggle to be a loving church, how will we ever love someone unconditionally? John 15, 12 through 14 says, My commandment is this. Love each other as I have loved you. This is the text where it starts out where you're wondering if Jesus is making number 11. He says, a new commandment have I. But not a new one, it's an old one. But I'm going to add one thing to it. I said you should love one another. And now I'm going to tell you I want you to love one another as you've seen me love you. Willing to die for one another. And if our church isn't known as a loving church, we need to change that. Are you a loving person? What do you want to come back to you? Because what you give is what you will receive. And you know the golden rule. Adventist should be a giving person. I preached last week on tithe, offering, giving your time. Money Magazine, way back, did a, a poll on churches. I don't know if you've ever heard about it or anything. It was back in the 80s, 1982. Money Magazine decided to find out just what do religious churches give. And I'm not going to start at the 100 and go down. But in giving, fourth place went to the Reformed Jews. Back in 1982, $480 per family was given per year. Third place was the United Church of Christ. $510 per family per year was given. Second place went to the Presbyterians right down the road. They gave $690 per family per year. And first place went to the Seventh-day Adventists. These churches gave 480, 510, 690, and Adventists were known for giving $2,400 per family per year. What do you think the people that did those statistics thought? And you know why we give so much? Because we don't allow tithe to light these lights. So if you want to give an honest tithe, on top of that, you have to support this building and support the conference and support that CYB and are you with me? These folks can give $690 because it'll light the church up and it'll do things and still pay the pastor. But we're following the Bible and God's blessing us. The Presbyterians do not have the mission outreach we have. So when you say, well, I pay tithe, that's not enough. We have an obligation to pay tithe, but your offerings, I said last week, they show God how much you love him. Remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, and that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. God's made an oath that he will bless if you'll follow him. An Adventist should be commandment keepers. People today outside our church call us legalistic, lawyers. Well, we have the fourth commandment. I read on that thing last night, down at the bottom, brothers and sisters, I hope you would read the last chapters of the Great Controversy. I've read it, read it, and reread it, and read it, and reread it. My original book I have that they gave me in 1979 at these meetings when they baptized me, I still have my original book, and it's wore out, taped, retaped, and I just glued it recently. Because it's the one that I made all my, my marks in, all my suggestions in. I've got thumb tabs sticking out of it. It looks like a marked Bible already. And I can open those thumb tabs, and they'll tell me why I thumb tab that. And I tell you, this time reading it through, and I'm almost done, I see clearer than I ever have what's happening right now in the United States. It's, it's just amazing. 
I have everything marked of what the Pope and all that. But this time, I read a little section, and I don't have this in my sermon. I read a little section, and it says the papacy is waiting for the Protestants to pass Sunday laws through our government, and they will come from behind and tell them, we'll back you. Who started Sunday laws? They did. But it says in there that they're going to pat them on the back. It says that they're going to let them come after us, and they'll say, we're behind you all the way. And they've never changed, brothers and sisters. And to think that this year they're going to speak at Congress, and this year they're going to speak at the United Nations, and then to read that text that he's going to suggest that what they want, Sunday laws, they'll back. When it's they that want Sunday laws. And then in that little paragraph, it says, and when it's too late, the Protestants will realize what they've done. They'll wake up, and it's too late. You and I need to be commandment keepers. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Don't let anybody ever tell you you're legalistic for keeping the commandments. We should be known for keeping the commandments. David says, I, I meditate on your commandments. I make them a part of me. Proverbs 3.1 says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. John 14.15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Adventists are Christians who love and therefore obey Jesus. Good works are the fruits of salvation. I'm glad for the present emphasis in our church on grace. And I'm glad we believe in works. Not works as a method to get to heaven. That's salvation through grace, faith. But you get more work done when you believe in who you're working for. We should be Sabbath keepers. There's something distinct about Seventh-day Adventists. There's 200 kind of denominations out there that keep Sabbath. Did you know that? Some well-known, some not well-known. But they're out there. A worldwide church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, believed wholly in the Sabbath. Others are out there. Seventh-day church of God's out there. There's 200 Sabbath-keeping denominations or people out there. But why are we different? Because some of them keep the Sabbath like others keep Sunday. They go to church and then go do whatever they want. And if you're in that, I'd suggest you change. God says that he's created 24 hours, and they're holy. They're for holy use. Genesis 2, 2 and 3 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and then he blessed that day. He sanctified that day, because then in it he had rested from all his work that he had created and made. Exodus 31, 13 says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it's a sign between me and you. I hope the sign, that the Sabbath is a sign between you and God. It's not just another day, and it's different from the rest, but it's a sign that you love God. If you love me, keep my Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 12 says the same thing. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they, may not, that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. You know what sanctified means? Set apart for holy use. He set a day apart, hoping to set a people apart. And the Jews refused to be that people. I hope you know that in Adventism we have a health message. We believe that God wants us to be healthy. You to become a Sabbath-keeping Adventist, we believe you should quit smoking. We believe you should quit drinking. 
You should be a, a healthier, holier person. Why? Well, here's one, and think about it. Picture Jesus on a street corner asking for a light. Anybody here could picture Jesus with a cigarette in his mouth? Could you see him go into a bar and says, I haven't got a penny to my name, would you buy me a drink? Could you see him out somewhere in an alley shooting up? If you can't picture Jesus doing that and you want to be like Jesus, then you wouldn't do it. Jesus taught us that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And by the way, Jesus wouldn't eat unclean meats. I've heard them make fun of us on our diet. They even did it in that little reading that I had. And they said that we're, we're going back to the Old Testament. Is it in the New Testament? They think it's in the New Testament that Peter said you can eat it. Peter had nothing to do with food. Seventh-day Adventists live an average of seven years longer. I love that. They did this research and found out we didn't live six years or five years or nine years, but they used the word seven. Adventists live an average of seven years longer. It's a proven fact. But I think part of that fact, and I really believe this, is that we keep the Sabbath. Have you heard where you can get cancer? You can get cancer from eating meat. You can get cancer from smoking. You can get cancer from drinking. Have you ever heard of stress cancer? If you and I would take a day off, be stress-free, I believe the Sabbath would come in there that you and I would be holier, happier, healthier if we really believed in the day and kept it the way God wanted us to. No one has ever loved Jesus without benefiting from loving Jesus. We have less cancer. We have a lot of advantages over the world. Would we have this health message if it wasn't for the spirit of prophecy? Oh, some say, well, we got the Bible. I said, that's great. So do all they have the Bible. You show me smoking in the Bible. You know that your body's a temple, but show me smoking in the Bible. But when Ellen White came out and condemned smoking, the doctors were saying to smoke. The smoke will go in and purify your lungs. And she said, that's just the opposite. She was crazy. I believe the spirit of prophecy is a blessing to this church that probably half of us don't realize. And when she says to read the very last seven chapters of the Great Controversy and you will see what's happening, this read-through, after 30 years, this read-through of that book, it is there. I want to tell you that Seventh-day Adventists are Christians. There's people who don't believe we're Christians, we're a cult. When they tell me that I'm a cult, I like that. I look at them and say, why? Well, you're just not following Jesus. I say, I don't know. Jesus went around preaching. They called him Beelzebub. Sounds like I'm following in his footsteps. If you're telling me I'm following the devil, I'm right behind Christ. Because I know what I believe. Adventists are the only church today that finds their roots in Revelation 10. You know Revelation 10? Take the book. Eat it. It'll be sweet to your taste, sour to your belly. It's the book of Daniel. We gave a message, and it ended up a bad message because we weren't right on the sanctuary, but we studied it out, brothers and sisters, and I believe we're right on. And because of that, we can go through Revelation 12, and that's the pure woman. And most important, we can go to Revelation 14, the three angels' message. And I'm falling in love more and more with that message as, as I teach and I see that the 2300 days ends when the first message of the angels is given. Tell them the judgment is come. 
And these folks don't know the three angels' message because they don't understand the judgment. They don't understand the judgment because they don't understand the sanctuary. And they don't understand the sanctuary because they don't think there's any message in it. They can read it. They can tell you how the high priest dressed and everything else. But you and I can dissect that and show them the whole plan of salvation. And then take them out of the Old Testament, bring them into the three angels' message and finish it off. You and I have the message for the last days. We have a unique church. We have a long way to go. We are not perfect. You look around and find a perfect person in here, even me. You won't find one. But I believe in it. I believe there is going to be a very elect. They're going to live through this, brothers and sisters. Maybe you don't want to. But never keep your eye on the thorns. There's little poems about that. There's stories about that, everything. Just remember, Jesus was the rose of Sharon. Keep your eyes on the roses and away from the thorns, and you won't get caught up in the politics of the church to where you're so upset you leave. The song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this church, the things that are happening, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We have some GC stuff going on now, brothers and sisters. And I don't know who's on whose side, but I know this church, through the spirit of prophecy, through the Bible, through 12 and Revelation, through chapter 10 of Revelation, it says, go and prophesy some more. This church is going to go through. Leadership don't know about. This church is going to go through. The safest place for me today is in this church. There's meetings going on. There's people arguing going on. There's people that are not sure that our doctrine's right today going on. Brothers and sisters, stick with the old time religion. I believe this church was started. It's a Bible-based church. I believe that it was written about in the Bible. I don't think we're drumming something up to say we're in Revelation 10. I think we're right on the mark, and I think we're crazy if we leave. Stick with it. And not only stick with it, but go find somebody else to tell about it. And if you don't understand it, get a hold of a book, Great Controversy or what, read a chapter in it, and go out and show them the chapter out of the book. But to me, today's the day to go do something. There are people out there that are tired of what's going on. There's people out there that are tired of humdrum sermons in their church. There is. There's probably pastors out there that wish they could preach the truth out of the Bible. And you and I could go help them. So what say we go help them? What so say we get inspired? We get more loving than they, they claim out there that this young man tells me, your church isn't loving. My church is loving. Do you know I couldn't wait to see him when I heard they threw him out of church? <laughs> I went over to him and said, so I, I, let's go back six months. How loving is your church? Oh, it's a fake love out there, brothers and sisters. And you've got the true love. Love those that don't love you. Love those that preach that you're a cult. Love them all. Sincerely love them. And to know that you would like to see them in heaven. We've got meetings coming up. We're going to start this August. We're going to go to the South Campus. Praise God, I went to the North Campus and the lady says it's $140 a night for a room. And we talked and talked. I was ready to, to rent that. And then she says, would you even think of going to the South Campus? Well, I don't know. What's the advantage? She says, it's free to nonprofit organizations. <laughs> I'm an Adventist. <laughs> and Adventists like that little four-letter word, free. We're known for it. We're, we've got the Jewish background. <laughs> we've got that hall for free. And there's a projector and a screen, and she said, well, it will be $25 a night. Oh, I, I can handle that. And we're going to stay there for not the duration, but all but the last week. 
We're not going to transfer right away. We're going to teach them whatever we can teach them and then see if they'll come join us. But brothers and sisters, I don't want to go fool them or anything else. I want them to see the gospel. And I hope you'll be there to encourage them. Instead of 10 visitors, we have 40 people in that room. But God bless you in your outreach. Do you believe in the Advent message? Well, Jesus says, come follow me. Are you following Jesus? And it ends by saying what? And I will make you fishers of men. He wants you to win somebody. And you don't have to preach. Bring them to the preaching. Just bring them and see what they think about what they hear. I've heard more and more people say they're impressed by us. There's a young pastor came. The house next to us is for sale. And if you want a house 3,800 square feet, five bathrooms, four bedrooms, one bedroom has two bathrooms, if you want this monstrous house that needs a lot of work. But praise the Lord, we went for a walk one day. And baby says, somebody else looking at the house. And of course, I don't care what people think of me. So I said to Marianne, let's see if we can go through it. And she says, the realtor is showing it to somebody else, and you want to walk up and say, can we walk through the house? Yeah. <laughs> and the day that I do that, there's been something like, would you say 10? 10 families have gone through that house. By the way, the house has been lowered from 194 to 159. They can't sell it. It's got a big swimming pool in the backyard. I don't want that. They can buy it. I'll go over. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an Adventist. <laughs> But we went over and, and, and knocked on the front door and went inside, and the realtor was there. And of all the people to be looking at that, that house that day was a pastor of a Baptist church in town. Now, he's making more money than I am, or his wife's got a good job, but I don't care. He recognized us. We met him at Crawdad's Day a year ago. And you know what he said? He says, so, so what do you do? Little Mary Ann was going, and they had a bouncing thing down there. You, you can use anything as a witness, brothers and sisters. Mary Ann went into the bouncing thing, and he stood there, and he says, so what do you do? And I said, I'm a preacher. What church? Seventh-day Adventist. I got your brochure in the mail. And you folks give out what I, he would call the perfect brochure. He said, I've never seen artwork like that. Brothers and sisters, we're known for that. You think that guy isn't going to get a personal one delivered to him? He said he was, if he didn't have a date, he had something on his schedule. If he didn't have a date, he was going to come to our meetings with Brother Ryan, Ryan Day. Man, do I wish he'd have walked in there and heard that young man just give that trumpet sound. But he didn't. But he's still alive, he's still breathing. And that means there's hope. Pray for somebody you know. Of all the days to, to have the guts to go up and ask to go through that house. The preacher's there. Now we drove by yesterday and there was a police officer there. So I said, now today's not the day to go through. <laughs> God bless us, brothers and sisters. He has. And he wants to. In fact, he wants to come. But we're holding him up. We're not giving the trumpet sound. I wish I had a trumpet here, but I probably couldn't blow it anyway. It takes something to blow that. But I wish I had one. And I'd blow it and show you how loud it is. When Jesus comes, an angel's going to blow that thing. And if you don't hear it, you're missing something. Let's sing our closing song. It's number 375. And sing it like we want to do it. We need to work. Would you all rise, please, for closing song?
coming a time when Jesus is going to say it's finished. He said partly on the cross, it is done. That was the sacrifice, and now he's up there in the judgment, and he's going to say it again. It's done. It's finished. And what side you're on, you're on. I just pray you're out working for God. There is nothing wrong with saying, I work for Jesus. The world will tell you that we're workers. Praise the Lord. We don't work our salvation through. We believe in saved by grace. Thank you again for the song. But brothers and sisters, there's a work to be done. Our dear Heavenly Father, help us to believe in what we believe in. We believe we're Adventists. We believe in Adventism. We believe this church was started by a movement. The midnight cry should be given, and you want us to be the ones to give it. Help us not to look back except to compare how on fire they are, were, and wonder if we're as on, as, as on fire as they were. Lord, we're 150-some years closer to Jesus' second coming. We should be the happiest people, the most willing to work for you people. We should be thrilled to do and to find one more soul for you. Bless us today. Help us to think of these meetings, to pray for these meetings. They may be the last meetings that we give in this area. We may not get to where these meetings are given. Lord, help us to be out looking for someone for Jesus. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.